grow up, I want to be an astronaut. When I get married, I'd like to have two children. My heart's desire is to see my daddy. I don't want to answer that. This is no ordinary afternoon with you. It's a very special occasion. We've brought these children together for the very first time. They're like any other children, except that they come from startlingly different backgrounds. We brought these children together because we wanted a glimpse of England in the year 2000. The shop steward and the executive of the year 2000 are now seven years old. In 1964, World in Action made seven up. We have been back to film these children every seven years. They are now 35. Give me a child until he is seven, and I will give you the man. Is it important for him? Yes. At 14, Tony was already an apprentice at Tommy Gosling's racing stables in Epsom. He left school at 15. This is a photo finish um, when I rode at Newbury. I'm the one with the white cap. I was beating a length and half a third and I had a photo finish. So I took it out of the box and kept it as a souvenir. My greatest fulfilment in life, when I, when I rode at Kempton, in the same race as Lester Piggott, I was a naive, wet behind a year's apprentice. All my years, from seven, all my ambition is fulfilled in one moment. And I eventually finished last, tailed off obviously, but it didn't make any difference to me. Just to be part of it, be with a man himself. Couldn't buy it. That was the proudest day of my whole life. Tony's now 35. At weekends, he takes his girls to a stables where the family keeps a couple of ponies. Hold on, come here, hold that brush. What's it mean to you when you see the girls on a horse? There are times you look back and you look at them and you see yourself in them all the time. When I was a kid, right, no one ever, ever showed me how to ride a horse. I had to sort of go out and do it myself. No, don't stop just walking. I want your walk, man. Hold them reins nice and proper. When I see them riding, I sort of like, ah, oh, I taught them that. Or I see them doing this, I think, ah, oh, I'll show them another way. Then we're gonna go that and once they learn it, I sort of like pat them on their bum, sort of put them on automatic pilot, you know, and they're on their own. Well, that's what life's all about, isn't it? Giving your kids all the opportunities that, and the benefits that you've never had. Don't be afraid, never be afraid, they know. Horses were my whole life, flesh, blood. In my veins, it was, you know, all the smell, everything. Princess Anne to her horses and Lester Piggott to eat. That's how I felt. And you let it go? I let it go. Sometimes on Saturday morning I go to the pictures. Sometimes with my friends, sometimes with him. You don't. I do. You don't. I don't ever see ya. You go to a different pictures. Have you got a girlfriend? Nope. Would you like to have a girlfriend? Nope. You understand for us? Find them, feed them, and forget them. For the other ref, I'll let you use your own discrimination. I mean, this one, I tried to do the free F's, but I couldn't forget her. I used to work in a pub, just on a Friday nights, barmaids, barmaiding. <laughs> and, um, and then from there one night, I went to um, a discotheque. He was in the pub earlier on, and that afterwards we went to a discotheque and Tony was standing there. And I just, from there, I just, that was it. <laughs> Couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> we have our ups and downs, no more than anyone else. I think you've got to work at a marriage. I think, 
all marriages go through stages. You can't stand each other. You go through, you know, I think, oh, God, I hate him. I wish he'd get out. <laughs> I do. And I'm sure he does about me. I've been in positions, you know, and... Oh, it's hard to say in front of Debbie, but it's true. It's tempting. You take the bait. You know, I go on holiday once a year with the boys type of thing to Spain, Magaluf, and we have a golf holiday, all against Debbie's will. <laughs> but it's true. And I get in situations out there that, you know, life is for living. And I come back, oh, I know what you've been doing out there. You've been meeting all them birds and whatever. And they look at you and as if to say, I know, but I don't want to know. That's how it is. It was just saying another ten years, me and him might have split up. Quite possible. You know, you, know. you don't know. If you were to break up, what do you think it would be over? It, yeah, I think it'd be the other party. It wouldn't be for the kids, because the, the kids is, they're, they're everything. Without anything prior to that. Isn't it? Mm. I mean, it'd break, it'd break my heart, knowing that another man would could come in here and bring my kids up. There's only one ambition, and really, I, I want a baby son. And if I see my baby son, that is my ambition fulfilled. No one knows that, only you now. <laughs> Tony and Debbie had a son, Nicky, who is now 13. Right, they have two daughters, Jodie and Perry, and the family lives in North London. Listen, on Saturday, I've got the arsenal. One I was expecting on 28 Out, wasn't I, when you filmed that? But I lost that baby. I didn't feel that I could have any more. I really didn't want any more. But then anyway, I did. I know Perry. They are naughty. They're very naughty. They're the naughtiest kids I know. Nicky's like me. He's more placid. But Jodie's like how he was when he was seven. I do discipline them. I, you know, I smack them. I'll put them in their rooms. I'll take things off of them. I do it. I discipline them and he undoes it. So I'm fighting twice as hard with him. It, it, it may, makes it harder for me because he's too soft with him. Why yeah. do you think you're too soft with him? Because I love him so much. Do you bring them up the way that you were brought up? The upbringing I had, I, I saw more dinner times than dinners, w without any question. And I did have my brother's clothes on my back for, you know, hand me downs. It's never done me no one. I wouldn't have got away with my parents, but my kids get yeah, away but, with Yeah, but in saying them. that, you do give them everything possible. All these designer clothes type of thing, the NAF gear and Roebuck trainers. Now, in my Nicky plays football, and uh, she'll say, oh, Nicky wants some trainers. Have you got 70 quid? So I'll go out, what? 70 pounds for a pair of trainers? Hold on. There's a store around there, same quality trainers for... Um, 25 quid or something. she go, 25 pound? Oh, no, she would say. Uh, he can't go to school wearing that rubbish. she would give him everything. The kid the, got an old bike, wants a chain put on and a few nuts to land up, or whatever. Oh, can't have that bike. Get a new one. Then in the next Christmas... Only because you don't put the chain and bolt to it. <laughs> I'm not that bike. What will you do if you don't make it as a jockey? I don't know. If I know I couldn't be one, I'll get out of the game. Well, what do you think you would do then? Long on taxis. At 21, Tony was on the knowledge, learning to be a London cabbie. I'm going to prove every person who thinks I can't be a cabbie over wrong. I'm going to get that badge and I'm going to put it right in their face. Just, just to tell them how wrong they can be and how underestimated I am. At 28, he had his own cab. I knew you'd pick up this here. I once met Kojak, I picked him up, and uh, Warren Mitchell, uh, Alf Garner, you know. Debbie's working in the day, so Debbie will be on her way home by 4 o'clock. The kids will be coming home for tea. Debbie will stop the cab outside, come in, cook the dinner. Then I'll sit down with the kids till about 7, whatever. Then I'll start the cab up, because we work the same cab. Then I'll go to work till about one until it goes again. She's got a great mind. She's done the knowledge, which is less than two years for a woman with three kids and the pressures running a family. That's remarkable. You get a lot of resentment still. 
from other cab drivers. Some of them, they just give you abuse. Some of them just sit there shaking their heads when they see you. Um, they get told to go home and do the dishes or go home and do your, your husband's dinner. I went to a knowledge school and there I met other girls doing the knowledge and um, we became quite friendly. We meet on a certain rank at Knightsbridge and we go and have a cup of tea. We have to walk around Harrods, get a sandwich, use Harrods blues, have a little look round, spray the perfumes and the lipsticks. Does he do his fair share of the housework? No, he doesn't do a thing. He doesn't even bring a cup from one room to the other. I, I do everything. Sounds awful, doesn't it? Terrible. Well, I'm not chauvinistic, don't get me wrong, you know, it's not a question of that. Um, I have a very luxurious, luxurious life indoors, right? And, uh, you know, I'm not proud to say it or ashamed to say it. I'm just the way I am. I mean, I work as hard as I can outside. And when I close that door, the feet go up and I feel I deserve a rest. Uh, would everybody please sit round now, get on with their work. I don't want to see any backs to me. Shouldn't be anybody turning round. Tony, do you hear as well? Get on with your work in front. Tony, don't turn round again. So what advantages do you think you've had over some of the other people that we've filmed? Oh, um, academically, probably they've had more advantages over me, aren't they? The fact they've had prep schools at a very early age, you know, they've benefited by it, which, you know, it tells, obviously, in this film. But as far as, you know, the stability in the backgrounds uh, with their parents, uh, they haven't, they've missed out on that. It was it February the 9th? Exactly ten minutes past nine. Mother's having a last, well at the time we never knew, a last breath. And she just died. When we held in the lad. And it was the worst moment of my life. We've respected that. She was and still is. The best girl in the world. And I'm <clears throat> sorry, but EastEnders, they're all close to their mums and, you know, like everyone else, wherever you come from, but my mum and I, I've made it clear from when we done 21. I just loved her. That's right. That's what I think, isn't it? I'd never met anyone like his mum in my life. I doubt I ever will. She was a lovely lady. She was a friend to me. She wasn't a mother-in-law. And um, we used to go everywhere together, me and his mum. I know the old man from the time of his life afterwards. He died there and then. But he walked around until September this year. When you buried him, what did you put in his coffin? Oh. <laughs> I put three cards and I put crown and anchor dice. I want a betting slip and a pin because that was my dad's own life. I'm at the grave side, I'm talking to her, you know, all little things, and I've got all images running through my mind saying, like, Tony, go downstairs, get me five weights, you know, one and a penny. And I used to go in the shop, she used to throw the cotton in an air curler over the, the landing, and I used to tie the cigarettes on this bit of cotton. And she used to pull them up. And she'd go, I'll see her in the end. Thanks, Tone, see you after school. Be good. And that's the way it was. And all little things like that. Mother having a drink in the pub, singing. Don't care what monkeys used to say. Don't care about nothing. They're pushing. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. They're nuts. Just have to touch them. Yeah, they... Well, they can get what they want, can't they? If you've got to work for it, and it's them, or can you just ask for money and get it? They can buy what they want. I'm not a politician, so let them worry about what's coming for the next day. All I understand is dogs, prices, girls, knowledge, road streets, squares, and mum and dad and love. That's all I understand. That's all I want to understand. How long are you going to be a cab driver? Is this what you want to do for the rest of your life? 
Well, at the moment, I'm, I'm very happy in driving a cab, but, uh, and I always considered owning our own pub. So obviously, I think uh, within two or three years, once I get finally financially straightened out, I'm going to have a go at being a publican. We did eventually get a pub about 18 months after, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, we, we went in partnership with my brother-in-law, and um, I saw the pub going in one direction, he saw it going in another one. And after about eight months or a year, wasn't it? Roughly. We decided to call it a day. Some is hard work out here. Come on, you're not reaching me yet. At 28, no, Tony was taking right. acting Be lessons. Bigger. Dominate me. All right, son? Yeah. Son, it's a big world out there, and obviously I'm not... I can't get into it, Brian. All right, don't worry. Pardon the expression, but can you do my inside leg? He now works as an extra. Well, I never got anything, especially acting. I mean, uh, but talent, who am I to say? I'm not going to say I haven't. But then again, who's to say anyone has? I promise you, I'm not there now. It's just the job. No more, no less. All that big eyes for stardom probably happened 15 years ago. I mean, but not now. It don't mean nothing, believe it or not. I don't want to change, because if I change and prove his other Tony Walker was all fake. I know, and I've always said it, there's never ever a thing in my life I've never set out to do that I've never achieved. I wanted to be a jockey, thank God. I rode on a race with Lester Piggott, and I did it. I wanted to be in the film game, I got in it. Working with Steven Spielberg for two weeks on one of his films. I made it happen on my terms, and now I can say... I helped him. And I'm more stronger in that respect. But you didn't pull it off. You didn't pull a jockey off. You haven't made it as an actor. You didn't pull off the pub. Well, it's better to be a husband than never was, wasn't it? Come My on, ambitions have gone out the window now because I'm, I'm, I'm running a family. I'm playing a role now. On, that is my role in life, I feel. But in saying that, come to the age of 35, I've done everything what I wanted to do. And I've got no uh, regrets, other than not making it as a jockey. That was my only regret. But we all live on dreams sometimes. But if they don't come off, I'm lucky you go again sometime. Tommy, do you have any boyfriends, Susie? Um, yes. Tell me about him. Uh, he lives up in Scotland, and he's, I think he's 13. And I'm, ra I'm rather lonely up there because he used to go to school. But I used to play till about half past six when he comes home from school. And then we go in and then he goes home to do his homework. Have you got any boyfriends, Susan? Yes. What, what is your attitude towards marriage for yourself? Well, I don't know. I, mean, I haven't given it a lot of thought because I'm very, very cynical about it. Um, but then, you know, you get a certain amount of faith restored in it. Well, I mean, I've got friends of, and their parents are happily married, and so it does put faith back into you. But me, myself, I'm very cynical about it. When I last saw you at 21, you were nervous, you were chain-smoking, you were uptight, and now you seem happy. What's happened to you over these last seven years? I suppose Rupert. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you some credit. <laughs> I'm now chain smoking. <laughs> I think, you know, you can't just walk through a marriage and think it's, you know, once you get married it's all going to be roses and everything forever. Um, you know, you have, um, well everybody has their rise, but it's, We've never yet had a ride that we haven't managed to sort out. Um, and I reckon, really, we've got a, we've got a pretty, pretty good marriage. When I get married, I'd like to have two children. I'm not very children-minded at the moment. I don't know if I ever will be. What do you think about them? Well, I don't like babies. <laughs> what was the biggest shock to you when you... Suddenly we're confronted with a, a small baby that you had to be responsible for. Panic set in, I think, um, that I wasn't going to be able to cope. Is it everything you wanted? For the moment, yes. I mean, I don't think I'll have any more for the reason that I've 
will get pleasure out of these two, but I can't see me going on and on and on. Mummy? Yeah? No, I want to. Very little has changed. My life probably is very much the same as it was then. I've had another baby, we've moved house, and that's about all. <coughs> Thomas is at a prep school now as a day boy, which he enjoys. Oliver's at school, and Laura's just started this week. Is discipline important? Yes. It must be. I, I wouldn't want to bring up three unruly rude children. I'd hate uh, people to look at my children and think, oh, you know, they don't want to have them for the day because they're so badly behaved and rude. But then, you know, some days you can spend your whole day just shouting at them because they're behaving so badly. Do you like to have a nanny to look after them or do you want to look after them? No, I want a nanny to look after them. That's the bit of the bed, isn't it? We didn't have a third child because we desperately wanted to have a daughter. I mean, you know, it's no point doing that, but it was lovely when she was a girl. Because I feel the boys all go off with Rupert fishing and stuff and I should be left on my own, so it'd be nice to have a girl around the place. Oliver's a very volatile child. It's him and I that have the problems. Right from the minute he was born, he screamed day and night and he's never got any better. He's got learning difficulties. Dyslexia may come into it, we don't know yet. I think he would benefit from being at a school where, he's, where he can cope better. As a teenager, Susie spent her holidays on her father's estate in Scotland. So what sort of things do you do? Ride, swim, play tennis, ping pong. And I might play croquet. Something like that. What about the social life? What's that? Jordan Persia? Yeah. Mm, it's quite fun. I came to London when I left school after Paris. You know, at the moment, I could never live in the country. I'm happy down here. Um, I mean, the country's nice for four days to go for long, healthy walks, but I mean, I could never live up there now. This is a wonderful atmosphere to bring up children. Do you think it, in some way it might be too secluded and safe for them? It could be. That's something that slightly frightens me, that it is. It's a very costed life they have here, and they've got to hit the world at some point. I just hope that I can help them cope with it. It is the most carefree time of your life. I'm not saying for all children. Well, I mean, any child going through their parents splitting up age 14 or at a very vulnerable age, and it does, I mean, it does cut you up, but, you know, you get over it. It's not, I mean, there's no point, there's no point in them staying together for me, because it was worse, I mean, the rise and... And it's, it's worse. If two people can't live together, there's no point in making yourself. I hope by Rupert and I giving them a close family unit, that they'll keep their heads and won't feel that they're slightly lost like I did. Where I wasted time was in my middle, late teens, and I think at that stage I didn't care. I just let those years go, really. I drifted. And it's too late now to look back. When I leave the school, I'm down for Heathfield and South Over Manor. And then maybe I may, I may want to go to a university, but I don't know which one yet. I like to do maybe short time typing or something like that. I left school when I was 16, went to Paris, uh, went to Secretarial College and got a job. Why, what made you decide to leave school and go to Paris? I just wasn't interested in school and just wanted to get away. Um, I was a partner in a quite a big law firm and I resigned from that and set up my own company. I tend to specialise in refurbishing old buildings and converting them into offices. Well, if Rupert's still got his property company in this present economic climate, I'd like to get more involved with that. It was a very difficult time when Rupert was deciding to leave. He's got a lot of responsibilities with all of us and it's not easy just starting off on your own. Do you ever worry that the roof might fall in and you'll be out of this and whatever? Yes, I mean it crosses my mind and this last year it's 
it's quite, you know, it's, it's crossed my mind quite hard that we might, you know, we could lose this if things don't pick up. When she was 28, Susie's father had just died. It's very hard to describe to somebody how you just take the loss. It is terribly hard, and even now I still can't believe my father's not here. Um, it's, it's still sinking in, I think. The death of one of your close family is probably something you don't ever get over, and it's a different kind of problem than anything else. Tell me about your mum. She was diagnosed before Christmas as having lung cancer. But she's strong, she's tough, and hopefully she'll pull her way out of it. Um, she's just had a horrendous operation. Um, she's still in hospital now, in a lot of pain. You see someone in pain like that, it's... especially someone that you love and care for, it's, it's very hard. Somehow I think when you're when you're faced with it, you just find inner strength. I think you think beforehand something awful, you can't cope with it. But somehow when it's there, you just get on. Someone somehow gives you some inner strength to cope with it. What do you think about making this program? I just think it's just ridiculous. I don't see any point in doing it. The first year or two after 28 Up came out, um, you know, I'd meet people or somebody, people in shops would ask me whether I was the girl that, that did the programme. And that's quite hard, because it's churning up all happy memories, sad memories, and it all comes flooding back, and parts of it I'd rather forget, and it's all there for people to see. And although most people are quite nice about it, you get the odd one, uh, who's fairly fairly rude, and I just think they're lucky they didn't have to have it done to them. I've had a very privileged life compared to some people. I've never really had to struggle to, to make my way, but I don't think I've taken for granted what I've had either. This may sound very arrogant, but you can't... If I let it worry me, I mean, I'd worry myself to death. I can't change what I was born into. Well, I'll go into Africa and try and teach people who are not civilised to be more or less good. No, I don't want to be a missionary because I just can't talk about it to people. You know, I'm interested in it myself, but I wouldn't be very good at it at all. So is this your missionary dream come true? Well, not exactly. Um, I'm a teacher now in London, and um, I've had the opportunity of, to come here for a term. And it just so happens the school I am in has l great links with this part of the world. Um, and, um, you know, I've come here to, to find out about the background of many of the, the boys that I teach back in London. At 35, Bruce is working in Silet, a town in the northeast corner of Bangladesh. Well, I'm earning my keep by teaching maths and, and helping the teachers here, helping them design courses of study, and I'm also teaching them English. Or help, they've all got quite good English, but practicing and improving their English. And then I've also got the chance to, to learn a bit of Bangla, which is very difficult and not doing very well at. Bangladesh, Bangladesh, Bangladesh. 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 Mango. Mango. Arm. Arm. Vestal, Vestas, Vestat. Vestamus, Vestamus, Vestam. Yeah, speak up. At seven, Bruce was at a pre preparatory boarding school. At fourteen, St Paul's School in London. They don't sort of enforce being upper class and things like that at St Paul's, you know, they suggest that you don't have long hair and they do get it cut if, and um, they, te they teach you to be reasonably well mannered but not to sniff on the poorer people. At 21, 
He was in his last year at Oxford, reading maths. And by Eisenstein, um, you can show that this is irreducible. Then you do a transformation on this polynomial, x equal to t plus 2. Good, and that's a nice way of doing it, particularly using Eisenstein down here. His test is very powerful. Yes. Yeah, I won't carry on with mathematics. I don't think I'll be a teacher. Chris, I'll be... Yes, sir! At 28, he was teaching. Immigrant children in East London. And to here, 25. But if you think it costs you 25... It's so different from your own education where you're teaching now. Why? General education is, um, is better for society, I think. Public schools are divisive. That's with no statement about my education. My education was academically excellent, and I was very grateful for it. Do you understand the game? I think there is a class society, and I think uh, public schools may help its continuance. And minus seven At 35, in Silette, he is teaching the older students. What does that become? I see education as a key to it all. Good, you know, good. I mean, I think once your population okay. becomes educated, it can think for itself a lot more and create wealth five. and create opportunities. That's good. Okay? Because you've got to get next squared. Okay? Now, when we come to the village, we're definitely going to go swimming. What do you like about Silette? I think so, yeah. Well, I think mainly that the people and their hospitality. A couple of weeks ago, I went on a visit to a family uh, with a teacher from this school. They lived in a one-room flat, but we were immediately invited in, and we sat round having food with them, and that's, that's what hospitality means. If I was back in England, and I turned up, say, to friends an hour before lunch with three people they'd never met, they'd say, well, let's go down the pub or something. I didn't agree with the Conservatives about what they were doing with the black people, you know, racial policy. Amanam Bruce, tell me Namkita. Everybody has the capacity to, to be racist, wherever you are in the world. I think it's a natural human condition, though, to be afraid of, of something that's slightly different to you. I think that's the basis of it. I mean, I know academically it's defined as prejudice plus power. When you've got the power to do something about it, then you can turn it into something very damaging to the person who's receiving it. I think if you recognize that as an emotional condition, Maybe you can use your intellect to, to check yourself. Has a country like this got any future? I think it needs an awful lot of help. The amount of general poverty, I think, is growing. You, know, you see so many children working. I mean, it used to be a rich area 200 years ago and more. People would call it the Pearl of the Bay of Bengal. You know, people wondered at it. And it's not that now. And that's not unconnected with the... British rule here. Basically, we don't care that many countries are incredibly poor. We, si we, si we simply don't care. I mean, it, we do raise money for charity I, and, and so on, which is excellent, but it's just simply not good enough at the end of the day. Well, my girlfriend is in Africa, and I, won't, I don't think I'll have another chance of seeing her again. Um, have you got any girlfriend? No, no, not yet. I'm sure it will come, but not yet. I mean, I do think a lot of people think too much about it. Uh, what happened when you burnt your fingers? Um, I'd rather not talk about it, really. Uh, well, no, but I didn't really mean that. I mean, I didn't really mean that I don't want to talk about it. Just that I need quite a long time to think about it. Really. I think I would very much like to um, oh, become involved in a family, my, my own family for a start. That's a, a need that I feel I ought to fulfill and would like to fulfill and would do it well. Yes, I haven't got married or whatever. And I suppose, you know, that, that would have been something which I hoped had happened. Um, you know, I suppose um, lots of reasons, really. I don't suppose I've met the right person. Okay. Well, about ten minutes. I mean, you just read out an article. Okay. I'm still a bit shy and awkward. still have a bit of growing up to do sometimes. I, th I think I'm a little bit immature sometimes. I can have quite sort of teenage-like crushes on people. Um, uh, and I can see myself sort of falling into it uh, and know exactly what's happening, but sort of unable to do anything about it. I've had affairs. Sometimes they've ended 
quite naturally with, with goodwill on both sides. Um, maybe I just haven't met the right person. Well, you're getting on a bit, are you getting worried? Well, not particularly. I mean, I'm always optimistic. I mean, who knows I'm, who I might meet tomorrow, but I think that's the trouble with reserve. You're not rejected, but you never know what might have been. But I'm getting better, you know, year by year. I think we all, we all grow up. What are the qualities in a woman that you look for? Well, somebody, somebody I get on with, I suppose. Not, not particularly, um, uh, not particularly attractive or whatever. I don't want this to turn into a sort of a, a dating agency video. My heart's desire is to see my daddy, who's six thousand miles away. We died about three years ago. I mean, he was seventy-two. I mean, we did drift apart because. He was in Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, as it now is. He did come back to England and retire. And I did used to go up to Yorkshire and see him, not as often as I should have done. I mean, I'm sure he had a fond feeling for me, and I'd like to have returned that in some way. Did you miss him? Well, I'd like to have been able to miss him, and I'd like to have got closer to, to be able to miss him. Uh, you know, I regret that chance of, of not getting closer at that time. You always need people to care for you because if you disappoint yourself by acting badly in a particular way, you tend most to hurt the people who love you. And you know, where, where would we be without having people to love you? At 28, Bruce was living in a council flat in East London. He's now in primitive lodgings in the middle of Sillette. Is money important to you? Well, not really. I mean, I have enough to live on. I don't know whether teachers deserve more money. My gripes have never been about money. It, they've always been about conditions of work. I find it horrible that, that people care so much about money. There are many more finer things in life than that. You know, people who bought the shares and the privatisation issues just to make quick, quick money. I just thought, well, well, what are you about in life? Is that, is that it? Um, you know, I didn't want any part of that. And this film is about opportunity. Do you think you made the most of your opportunities? My opportunity was, was to do what I wanted and what I found fulfilling. Um, and I had a great variety because of my background, yes. I've made the most of my opportunity because I found something to do that I, that I find rewarding. And that was my opportunity. I see education as being very important, you know, which is why I'm distressed by something which I see in Bangladesh, you know, the young kids working so hard, they need to bring the money in for their family. You know, I'd say, well, education is a right. The more they learn, the more choices they have in life. Life should be a, a rich experience. Oh, um, love Jeffrey, and we all want to marry him. Yeah, I think I know the one that he likes best, and that's her. <laughs> plenty of boyfriends, but what? Not one. Yeah, not one in particular. You, oh, you, friends, you're friends, yeah. you're, you're friends with Kent, your boys, you know. We had a teacher at school that uh, his favourite ploy was um, all you girls want to do is yeah, walk yeah. out, yeah. get married, have babies, and push a pram down the street with a fag hanging outside your mouth. Mm. Women are, are expanding into so many different areas now that it, it must be getting easier. And I mean, I could still be working now and have a family if I wanted to. The number of people in my situation, single, not single parents as such, but divorced single parents, is unbelievable. And the people of my mum's generation, it's, it's still rare, very rare. I mean, for my mum to have contemplated leaving my dad was far... I mean, I don't even know what she would have done. That's right. Yeah, because she never dreamed of working until the youngest one went to school. So I couldn't, I couldn't imagine where she would have gone or what she would have done. We haven't got that problem. Mm. If a relationship is not working, then it's, it's acceptable in society to bail out. Mm. Well, I know he is her and he loves her. <laughs> I don't. I love you. <laughs> I don't think I'd uh, 
get married too early. <clears throat> I like to have a full life first and like to meet people. And, yeah, mm -hmm. before you go and yeah. meet yourself to a family. Sue was 24 when she married Billy. They had two children, William and Catherine. I think that to get married young, there must be things that you miss. You must miss that crucial stage of being yourself because the minute you get married, you're no longer a, a single being. You're a partnership and that should be the idea behind it. Go on then, you go first. You, what was that one? Turn it over and put it back in the same place. Just after we made the last one, I had Catherine. And then oh, no, she was about a year and marriage started to sort of dissolve around us really and we decided to go our separate ways. I've never sat down and thought, um, well, what was it? Was it this? Was it that? I just knew it wasn't working and um, the discussion really was the best way of, of, of splitting up rather than you know, why are we splitting up? It, it was a really strange... It's, I think it was, seemed so obvious to both of us that it was probably easier to do than it should have been. <laughs> I have a regular one night a week when I can go out. It just happens to be that in this particular circle, most of them are separated or are divorced. You have common problems, so sometimes it's easier because you recognise each other's problems with babysitters. You know that it's not always possible to drop everything and go out. I think that the women want more out of life now. That is basically why they won't put up with a less than happy marriage. Are you ready for a long-term relationship? Um, I don't think you're ever ready for a long-term relationship. Either it happens to you or it doesn't, really. I mean, I certainly wouldn't kick one in the teeth if it, <laughs> it creeps up on me. Yeah, I mean, why not? Did you meet enough men before you decided who to marry? I've been married a year and a couple of months. Um, you do think, Christ, what have I done? See, I've still got my... And I'm being honest about it. Mm. And I think it's the same. You think, at times, you think, Christ, what have I done? Lynn married Russ at 19. He works for the post office. They have two daughters, Sarah and Emma. I'm very much geared to the family unit. I mean, us all, we do things together all the time. I mean, there are times when Russ and I, obviously, we, we like to leave it all behind and go out just the two of us. Now, as the girls are getting older, we've actually started to take them with us. I'll say, oh, we haven't done very much, but when you look back, we have. It might only just be playing games or going swimming or going for a walk. We're doing it together. If you think that getting married, as far as we're concerned, is a case of going to work, coming home, cook tea for hubby, going to bed, come, getting up, going to work, you, you're totally mistaken. Jackie married Mick when she was 19. I'm not sure I would recommend it. I think... Uh, if, but again, you're, you're generalising. I mean, if I, I would say on average, 19 is probably too young. We decided ourselves, I mean, just between the two of us, we knew it wasn't going any further. <clears throat> we both knew, I think, that at the end of the day, we would be happier leading our own lives. Whether that involved other people, you know, was to be seen, but. No, it, it would, I mean, you've got to bear in mind, we had no children to worry about. So really, the only people that were getting hurt by us was us. If I could, I would have some two girls and two boys. Yes, I would have. And what about you, Jackie? My mum, because she got five girls, shared them in seven, um, seven years bad luck. That's why she's got five girls. I'd like to be able to have a happy family. I mean, I know that's not possible to be happy all the time, but as much of the time that was possible. Go through there, that's the nursery. Got any plans? Oh, do me a favour. At 21, Jackie had moved into a new house. By the time she was 28, she had decided not to have children. Basically, I would say because I'm far too selfish. I enjoy doing what I want, when I want, and how I want. And uh, certainly at the moment, I... I, I 
can't see any way around that. It's not to say that that's a, a, a forever decision. Oh. And this one on. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Had a yeah. brief but very sweet relationship, the result of which was Charlie. Cool, blonde. Charlie, you're supposed to clean your teeth, eating the brush. It's the best thing that could have happened to me. Yeah. And I would never have believed I could have enjoyed a child as much as I enjoy him. I actually sat down and, and sort of thought about, should I have him um, or not? I thought about what I was going to do if I did have him, how I was going to keep him. Um, but it comes back to the same old story, the family. Yeah. Oh. Oh, nice. Oh, look. My father's only comment to me was, it is your decision. You tell me what you want to do, and then we'll take it from there. <laughs> and they've totally raved around me. Anybody that wanted to know just got told I was pregnant. I wasn't with the father. End of story. The people that know me know the full story, and that's all that matters to me. And Charlie will when he gets older. No, certainly don't want to roll. Don't give him nothing like that. When I got married, the primary reason was because I wanted to have a child. Uh, the two, to me, went together. Why did you have a child out of a marriage that wasn't working? Because I wanted to have more than one child. And it was the thing about being an only child myself. I was always jealous of other children that had brothers and sisters when I was growing up. And I didn't want to have more than one child with two different fathers. I think that brother and sister should have the same mother and the same father. That is my ideal. I would hate to think it was tough on the, on the kids. William used to say, why isn't Daddy living here anymore? And I would say to him, well, you know how you and Catherine argue and get on each other's nerves. Well, I said, that's how Daddy and I are. We, we, we just find that we're happier if we're not living in the same house. I'm going to work in Woolworths. At 21, Lynn was working in a mobile library in Tower Hamlets in East London. Yes, I'm not Sleeping Beauty. Teaching children the beauty of books and watching their faces as books unfold to them is just fantastic. To work with children of that age, you've got to love them. And I love children. The last ten years of government have actually, in my opinion, brought this country much, much further downhill. We have lost an awful lot of our National Health Service, an awful lot of our education system. I'm actually on the governing body of two schools. And I want the best for those kids. that the system can provide. And if the system's not good enough, then we better the system. What would you do if you had lots of money, but, um, me, two pounds? I would buy myself a new, new nice house, you know. One yeah. that's all nice and comfy. Do you get depressed by money problems? No, why? Why should you? If you can manage on what you got. You get depressed over money. I, it's I, so I easy do. to. But I why do. should you? Why when I reach the 18th day of the month and my mortgage is due on the 20th and there's nowhere near enough money in there, I get depressed about it, obviously. What money? <laughs> it was hard, first of all, when I gave up work from having a, a fairly high salary um, to nothing was hard. But uh, you, you get used to it, whatever your circumstances are. Um, you live in them, you get used to them and you cope. Everybody does. Sue now works part-time for a building society. Everything's changed for me because I'm now supporting myself a lot more uh, than I was, say, a year ago. How did you feel about living off Social Security? I hated it, really. I hated it, yeah. Perhaps it's old-fashioned values. I mean, my mum and dad have certainly never been in that situation, but then my mum and dad have never been single parents either, so, you know, you, you have to do what's best for you and, and the children. Thanks very much. Hi. Bye. I took a year off when I had Charlie, and the state kept me for that year. But I went back to work, and although, to be honest, by the time I pay everything out, I'm not actually that much better off, but I feel better. You take it from there. Can I get through this week, or can I get through this month? You know, can I get Charlie the things he needs? 
but somewhere along the line you get the money you need for whatever you need and as it goes at the moment we're working and we're trying to keep our families as best we can Why is it that you three haven't changed so much, do you think? Perhaps we've all I mean, grown we've all up. Had, we've, <laughs> we've all had stable, a stable background with stable relationships all the way through. I mean, mm. the same people that are there now that were there then. She initially went into hospital for an exploratory operation. Um, they found out she had cancer. Although at that stage we didn't really know how bad it was. She was ill at the time. Um, they started chemotherapy and radiation treatment and she was just so bad. Mum badly wanted to come back to the family and the family needed her here. She then spent nine months ill. I wouldn't have wished on anybody. She sat down on the settee and she died. Just like that. And we were up in Norfolk with my in-laws at the time. Um, so all we got was a phone call from Dad to say that Mama died. And how did you deal with it? I'm still dealing with it now. But then although she's not with, with us in body, she's still with us in spirit. She was a great friend to me as well as a mum. Probably the best friend I'll ever have. And as you see, it still makes me very emotional now. It's only two years. To some it probably seems, oh, it's a long time. It's not very long. The part is that you don't help them, they sort of die soon, wouldn't they? Some people are just born into rich families and they're lucky. I don't, I don't see why they should have the luck when people have worked all their lives and haven't got half as much as what they have. It just don't seem fair. But we only had a limited choice anyway, I mean, truth be told, I mean, we, we yes, didn't we have did a choice have a of private choice. education because oh, they no. couldn't have afforded it anyway. So we just went to the school that we wanted to go to and we made the best of it when we were there. That is something that perhaps when it comes to our children, we would say to them, why not go further? All I am interested in, probably the same as the other two, is what is good for me, what is good for my son. And that's it. I don't, I don't sit there envying maybe what Susie could do for her children that I can't do for my... Yes, I'd love the money to be able to put him all around the world. I'd love to be able to do that, but I haven't got it. And at the end of the day, I'm going to do what I can. At this precise moment in time, it's probably one of the best times of my life. Come here. Come and put your top on. I think probably because I've got Charlie. He's totally transformed my life. A lot of the times I obviously pull my hair out, but certainly for the better. So, yes, I'm a lot happier within myself. People around me have noticed that. So it's a good time for me. Kiss a cuddle. I don't really want Charlie to be an only. I'd love him to have brothers and sisters. But not necessarily loads of them. Just, you know, one, one would do, actually. I think Charlie would like that as well. I think Charlie would love it. A year ago, Lynn started having blackouts. She took medical advice. They stuck all these tubes up inside me and uh, discovered that I've got these veins up here that shouldn't be there. In your brain? Mm-hmm. And what can they do about it? Not a lot at the moment. They're investigating other treatments, but um, the surgeon says that uh, he doesn't want to operate at the moment because the risk, um, it's too near the optic nerve and there's an 80% chance of hitting the optic nerve. So is it frightening to know you have this condition? It was for about a week, but uh, it got itself into its own place within my system, where it's sort of amongst my rungs of priorities. And I overcame the fear of it. Now it doesn't worry me at all.
And we've all got little secret dreams. I mean, I loved drama at school. And I loved to sing, along with millions of others. So I would have liked to have, have carried that further. I mean, it was discussed at, at one stage, you know, going to drama school and pursuing it, but I really, at the time, didn't have the bottle. Didn't want to give up work and income as a young person. I was quite enjoying myself. I didn't want to risk all that to follow the dream. The boat there. So are these good times, too? Not particularly, no. I've got two lovely children now. But it's like another crossroads for me now. I don't know which way I'm going to go, what's going to happen. I'm on my own, basically. I'm starting again. Are you changing? I'm just growing up. <laughs> I don't think you ever stop growing up. The circumstances are changing, so I'm just adapting. When I grow up, I'd like to find out all about the moon and all that. At seven, Nick, a farmer's son, was at a one-room village school in the Yorkshire Dales. And I said I was interested in physics and chemistry. Well, I'm not going to do that here. At 14, he was going to a Yorkshire boarding school, and at 21, was reading physics at Oxford. So what career are you going to pursue? It depends whether I'll be good enough to do what I want to really do. I would like, if I can, to do research. The gas in these experiments is at a temperature comparable with that of the sun, whereas in a power reactor, it would be maybe 10 times the temperature of the sun. At 28, he had moved to America and was doing nuclear research at the University of Wisconsin. So how's it going, Rich? Tell me about the current drive. OK, well, you're all looking at this thing expectantly, so maybe I'd better say something about it. The first one is basically saying that the rate of change of crystal momentum, it's DDT of this quantity, H bar K, that is equal to the Lorentz force. He is now an associate professor at the university. It's a Madison-friendly place. Yeah, very friendly. It's a fairly small little community. And you get deer and things running through here, so it's kind of nice. You know, you notice if you walk into a shop here, or a store as they would call it, people are much more polite to you than they are in England. And it's not, and it, you know, it's not just a matter of being obsequious. They just try and be reasonably friendly and smile at you. Do you have a girlfriend? I don't want to answer that. I don't answer those kind of questions. I thought that one would come up because when I was when I was doing the other one, somebody said, "What do you think about girls?" And I said, "I don't answer questions like that." Is that the reason you're asking it? No, I thought so. Um. The best answer would be to say that I don't answer questions like that, but I mean, I'd, you know, it was what, what I said that when I was seven, and it's the, still the most sensible, but I mean, what about them? Nick was only 17 when I first met him, and I knew he was a nice person. I find him very attractive, and he uses his intelligence in his relationship with me, which is very important to lots of people. She felt that she like wasn't portrayed at all like she is and that she felt foolish as a result of it all. You know, she, she was really taken by surprise by how she came over and she uh, really wasn't sure why she came over that way, that way but she was very unhappy with everybody involved and so she just didn't want to be in that position again. Is she difficult? At times, yes. <laughs> Whenever we have an argument, she does have a tendency to explode, I suppose, to get... No, to get, to get really miserable about it and not... We've only, we've only been married four years. Anything could ha happen. We could easily drift apart. There are so many pressures on people. You just people saw the last film and thought, this marriage isn't going to work, this marriage isn't going to last. Did you get that response? Well, it's actually such a mystery to me what they thought they were talking about that I really just don't relate to it at all. I have no, I just don't know why they said that. I mean, the sorts of things that you were seeing, it was us trying to be very honest about it. And that may have been the place in 28 where we probably were working hardest about really describing what things were like instead of, I was just saying, I sometimes 
just am very dull and neutral and don't show too much of myself. Well, in that, I think we were just trying to be really upfront and say, this is what it's like, and we're working very hard at it, and hopefully it'll work out. Um, if that sounds to somebody like it's in jeopardy, well, that's their problem. <laughs> The big issue for us at the moment is how are we going to manage to have kids and run two careers? No, but in those early formative years, would you be happy for your children to be brought up by Jackie and Jackie not be able to give them the full attention? Well, it's not. I mean, that, that's okay, putting it in a rather strange too, way. Yeah? Yes, I mean, I want... Not just me. I, I, this, is, this is an area... I pay lip service to the idea of equal shares on this as well, and it remains to be seen whether I would actually live up to my intention. Yeah, there, are, there are several things, I think, to be said here that... I don't want to be the person left behind while Nick flies in and shares an adult life with his children at college and working. I want to be there too. Nick and Jackie now have a one-year-old son, Adam. On the subject of Adam, I'm, I enjoy doing this for the most part, but I don't want the sins of the father to be visited on the son in this case. So I'm, we've sort of decided that we want to keep him out of this to some extent or well to some extent essentially altogether when i grow up i'd like to find out all about the moon and all that where did you get all this brain power <laughs> all this brain power i don't know this is one that we were quite proud of glow discharges between a couple of metal plates where there's an ionized gas in between and so we had i suppose i am very ambitious in terms of trying to get my research to go forward. I'm also trying to train students so that they can actually acquire some useful skills and can go out and just be really useful contributors themselves and push back the frontiers of what we're capable of doing. They'd like to come out for a holiday in the country when we like, when I like to have a holiday in the town. Oh, I've been to Leeds a couple of times and I haven't been to Manchester. Um, I went to London with the other th pro when you did the first program, but that's the only time I've been. In my position, I don't feel that I'm letting England down because I don't think that England particularly wanted me there doing what I was doing. So how can I feel that I'm betraying a country when it doesn't want me to do to do what it's trained me to do? Do you get um, lonely here? You just tend to get stuck into your everyday routine and you don't think about it. But when you call home, then you realize how far away you are. And now it seems acute because both our families are getting older. <laughs> Even if you think in terms of seeing them once every two years, that's not you're, so many you're thinking times, only about ten times. And that's awful. When you think in those terms, you realize what it, you, know, you really are in exile. Do you miss England? An awful lot, yeah. My parents managed to get over here a couple of times in the last two years, and Andrew, my middle brother, was here about two years ago, so that's pretty good going in a way that they got over here. Now Christopher is the brother who is deaf, as you know, and his language skills are getting better, but he certainly didn't get a flying start from the educational system that he went through, so, you know, he really is still getting to the point where you, know, you can't, I mean, well, he can't hear essentially at all, so you can't really have a conversation with him on the phone, but he'll get on the phone and he'll tell you a bunch of stuff and you can understand most of it, so that's really nice. Is it painful for you? Well, the thing that was emotional to think back on was, was the situation when he was probably a year old and it was really becoming clear to everybody that despite the fact that his doctor had originally insisted no he wasn't deaf that it became pretty clear that he was and you know at the time I just sort of desperately was hoping it wouldn't be true you know that somehow you know some sort of miracle would happen and he would turn out not to be so but then I told myself well if he weren't then he wouldn't be the same person and it would be wishing that the person didn't exist so you know that wasn't the appropriate way to think about it do you think you can build a life here? Well, well, you know, one is trying to, but it is very difficult being in a place where you're 
a long way away from all your background and you don't have any sort of support network, it really does mean you have to fend for yourself to, you know, you keep thinking <laughs> you're, really, you're really being called on to show pioneer spirit every now and again, it seems. I don't have this urge that you sometimes hear people saying of, I want my child of all the things I didn't. I don't look back and think I was deprived. There were things that I had in a certain sense as a child, which were not material things that I had, but situations I was in and experiences that most children wouldn't have. Growing up on a farm and actually working on the farm and be being in the situation of being told, clean out that calf shed really has sort of made me very determined to get things done and not give up halfway through something. It develops a sort of a streak of stubbornness that can be useful. Now, the trouble with me is that I tend to take the streak of stubbornness too far and I have to try and mellow out a bit. Have we travelled a long way since that seven-year-old in his big muddy boots? I suppose an awful long way, yes. I mean, I'm sure there's... A lot of the same personality that was in there is still here. Uh, still easily embarrassed and confused. <laughs> I mean, I think that you can see that the, the saying about give me the boy until he is seven, I, I'm quite prepared to accept that there's a lot in that. If you could look at me at seven and see through the sort of superficial things and the silly things I was saying, or if you could see to what made the child tick, there was probably an awful lot in there that's here now, yeah. I read the Financial Times. I read Observer and the Times. What do you like about it? John? Well, I like... I usually look at the headlines and then read about them. What... about it. What's the point of the programme? It's the point of the programme is to reach a comparison. I don't think it is. Because we're not necessary typical examples. And I think that's what people seeing the programme might think. Yes. Falsely. I mean, no, they, they tend to, to typecast us. So everything we say, they'll think, oh, that's a typical result of the public school system. Yes. It's certainly true that poor pe more, more people know they have more options or imagine they have. I think in practical terms, the difference in numerical number of options isn't that great. But the mere knowledge creates an option in exactly, itself. Yes. So I think we I do have more it. options. And it is undesirable, but it's very difficult to correct. I don't think it is undesirable at, at all. I think what's undesirable is people who have had options don't make advantage of take take best advantage of them. When I leave the school I'm going to call it court. And then I will be going to Westminster boarding school if I pass the exam. And then we think I'm going to um, Cambridge in Trinity Hall. John went to Westminster School and read law at Christ Church, Oxford. I do believe parents have a right to educate their children as they think fit. And I think someone who works on the assembly line in some of these car factories and earning a huge wage could well afford to send their children to, to private school if they wanted to. At 21, we asked him what career he would pursue. Might be at the bar. Doing what? Perhaps chancery practice. I now have a career. I'm a barrister. Um, other than that, life chugs along in varying degrees. John entered the chancery division of the High Court and specialises in company law. How wonderful. Very have you told Alexandra? Yes, I when I leave school, I'm going to the Dragon School. I might. And mum is and I might go to after I might go to Charterhouse Marlborough. And I can't I can't remember all the other places but because Mummy's got so many but there's uh, some of them. What about university, uh, Charles? I might go to Oxford. Charles went to Marlborough. But he didn't go to Oxford. In fact, Instead, he went to Durham University. I'd say I, I'm, I'm pleased I didn't, because there's very much a sort of, sort of certain from Marlborough, prep school, Marlborough, Oxbridge, conveyor belt. Yeah. 
shoved out at the end. And what did Charles want to do? I'd say probably scribbling away in some basement or some London newspaper or something. Charles did scribble away for an East London newspaper and then moved on to the BBC where he is now a producer. He married last year. He prefers not to be on television. I'm going to charter house and after that Trinity Hall, Cambridge. Andrew went to Charter House and Cambridge, where he read law. I'd like to be a solicitor, and also fairly successful. At 28, Andrew was a solicitor in a large London firm. What qualities do you think it needs to be successful? Well, you have to have a, a legal ability in my business, obviously, and you have to have a sort of bedside manner as far as your clients are concerned. There's no good being brilliant if you can't really if you can't communicate with your clients. At 35, he had become a partner in the same company. Well, I work in the corporate department of a large firm of solicitors in the city. That is dealing with things like um, mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, general corporate advice, putting deals together for for clients. What do you think about girlfriends at your age? Um, well, you think well I've got one, <coughs> but I don't think much of her. I don't think I financially come from the same background. Mm, um, Andrew didn't go for a haughty Deb. He went for a good Yorkshire lass. But, I mean, obviously he knew what he wanted. At 28, Andrew had married Jane. Well, I suppose the most important thing that's happened is that we've had two children. One five years ago, Alexandra, and then a couple of years later, Timothy. We've also moved out from central London over to Wimbledon. We decided we should look somewhere where there was a bit of green space, and so we moved out here. What was the biggest surprise about having children? Um, that our ideas of bring them up maybe not necessarily always coincide with each other. When I see the children playing together now, um, I realise how much fun they have together, and it's probably what I miss perhaps is being an on only child. When boys go around with girls, they don't pay attention to what they're doing. Yes, as my grandmother had an accident because a, a boyfriend was kissing her girl, his girlfriend in the street. Well, the most important thing is that I've got married. He married Claire, the daughter of a former ambassador to Bulgaria. Recently, I think uh, this charity, Friends of Bulgaria, is something that's very important in my life. I became involved in all this to channel aid to Bulgaria. It is a great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of Friends of Bulgaria. My mother, in fact, is from Bulgaria, and that explains why, for me, Bulgaria is an especially important place. We decided for our inaugural event that it would be a good idea to have a concert. And as I'm a barrister, um, I would hoped I'd be able to get access to one of the halls of the Inns of Courts because they are very magnificent buildings. It is coincidental that we met, but it's obvious that the Balkan uh, connection was a strong mutual interest. I think it's not a bad idea to pay for schools because if we didn't, schools would be so nasty and crowded. Yes. So do I think so. Yes. And, and the people in yes. the schools wouldn't... And, and the, poor people the, the, come rushing the in. man in mm. charge of the school would get very would, angry. Would get a, very angry because he and would he, gets he wouldn't he, w no. he wouldn't he wouldn't be able to pay all the masters if he didn't yes. get any money. At seven, the boys are singing waltzing Matilda in Latin at their exclusive private school in London. And education is very important. And you can never be sure of leaving your children in any worldly goods, but at least you can be sure that once you give them a good education, that's something that no one can take away. The important issue is drawing the distinction between allowing people to spend the money they earn, in other words, low taxes, and also putting enough money into the infrastructure, things like education, health service, transport system. And that's a very difficult balance to, to draw. And I'm not sure that we're doing the right thing at the moment. I think more should be, put, be being put into that. And I think perhaps people would be prepared to pay higher taxes 
to pay for that sort of thing. Yes, and that mustn't be late there. Yes, I must say, all, all this talk about opportunities, it's something I did, did slightly object to in, in the programmes. We were shown at the age of seven, outlining sort of the academic sort of career that most of us will, did in fact pursue, you know. We didn't show the sleepless nights, the sort of pouring over our books, the sort of, you know, all the sweat and toil that, that got us to, to universities. It was, it was presented as if it was just, you know, part of some indestructible birthright that we went to all, all these places. And I thought that was un unfair. It didn't show us sort of having to do beastly jobs in the holidays. If I had a son, I would like uh, to send him to Westminster, where I went where I suspect the public schools or the major public schools win uh, over the state schools is in the quality of the staff that they attract. I mean certainly at my school the teachers were absolutely first rate but on the other hand we had very little in the way of uh, facilities and computers and language laboratories that are taken for granted in uh, many state schools and I think when people talk about more resources uh, they often mean more money being spent on, on, on these things, which in a sense are inessentials, and less money is being spent on what really matters, which is the quality of the teachers. The rich children always make fun of poor children, but, I yeah, think. Yeah. But the acquisition of sacks and sacks of money is not something that I set much importance by. Uh, I'm not money-minded, I would say, in that sense. On the other hand, it would be hypocritical to pretend that a lot of the things that I take for granted and... Uh, my lifestyle is uh, dependent on having a fair amount of money. But I can't say that it, the acquisition of more money is one of my main aims in life. We now have a, a house in the country which takes up a lot of our time and energies and I seem to spend an awful lot of my time gardening furiously trying to tame the wilderness that we inherited there. I'd have laughed if ten years ago you, you'd have told me that I would spend most of my time digging herbaceous borders and things, but that's what I seem to do and I enjoy it. One good thing about having quite a large house in the country now is that uh, I've taken up playing the piano because I always had a piano in London but with work I never had time to practice and now we've got room to house a piano in the country and I find I, I am now practicing quite a lot and um, beginning to get it back a bit. Certainly, I can never tell the difference between you playing and the CD playing when I'm out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. very good. Well, she's very diplomatic. No, no, it's true. <laughs> Does money concern you a lot? No, I think as long as one has enough to be comfortable, that's, that's really what one should aim for. We took the children skiing for the first time last year, at least Alexander, and uh, he really enjoyed it. Is the family unit the most important thing in your lives? More than your own ambition? Or? I'm not sure I have any ambition as such now. Um, I mean, just to progress with my work and so on. I think ambition probably changes once you've got children. Your outlook on life is no longer the same as it was before. And you can still have ambitions in the fact that you want to be successful in your work. But the end result is that if you're successful in your work, then you can enjoy your success with your children and hopefully with your wife as well. I think the more you've had out of the country, the, the, the more privileges you're, you're born with, the, the greater your duty is. I still feel, as I did when I was 21, that it's important for people who have had advantages to try and put as much back uh, uh, and to help others less fortunate than themselves if they can. In England, as we all know, there's a perpetual uh, debate about the National Health Service being starved of resources. But people who go on about the government butchering the National Health Service, I think, should come over to Bulgaria to see what being kept short of necessary supplies and funds really does mean. <laughs> but what we're doing is going around delivering drugs, firstly, that uh, we've managed to purchase with monies so far raised by our appeal and also at the same time trying to find out what it is that they really need so we can be sure that we're getting the right things through to the uh, right destinations. We've been told that in some places it's impossible to do uh, even operations, albeit they have the operating theatres and they have excellent doctors for want of simple anaesthetics. In other places, uh, 
For instance, the children's home at Vidrare, they're even lacking such simple things as soap and detergent. These are things that we can supply in England very painlessly, and yet here they really make a lot of difference. The Bulgaria that I have known coming back with John has been a much more varied uh, country, and it has been very enriching to travel around the country with John and to have the extra dimension of John having investigated to a great degree his um, family tree down through many generations and many um, centuries. Second along there, my great great grandfather, who was the first Prime Minister of Bulgaria when the country was liberated from the Turks in 1879. Well, I think everyone needs to have a feeling that they belong somewhere, and that there's a plot of land or somewhere where they hail from and their roots are. Within the last month, a new agricultural law has been passed returning land to its former proprietors. We think that some part, at any rate, of this property will come back to us. And I, for one, am very excited at that prospect. It belonged to my grandfather, his brother, uh, and they farmed it in the whole estate in partnership with my great-grandfather. Looking at it with a professional eye, I've dealt with worse than this in Northamptonshire. I don't think there's anything that couldn't be sort, uh, sorted out uh, given six months or so, and a couple of house guests to stay. Do you think you and Claire could live here? Ask me that in seven years' time. I don't think much of the accents. Neither do I. What's been the effect of being in these films on you? I don't think there has been any effect, really. From time to time I meet someone who I've ne never met before who says, I think I've seen you somewhere before, haven't I? And I say, well... Perhaps. I try not to talk about it. It's Sean McInnes, you've got three minuses in a day. He's a pest. And I must say, I mainly laugh when I see myself at seven. Obviously, I said some shocking but extremely funny things in retrospect. It has to be said that I bitterly regret that the headmaster of the school where I was when I was seven pushed me forward for this series because every seven years, a little pill of poison is injected into... Uh, I know. Well, it's, this, well, it's the truth. I, 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 I dislike intensely being on uh, television. I refused to do this programme last time round, and I'm only doing it this time because I see this as an opportunity to draw the attention of viewers in this country to uh, the awful problems uh, in Bulgaria uh, and uh, I in the hope that they may uh, wish to do something to help the situation here. I don't like um, the big boys hitting us and the prefects sending us out, out for nothing. I know I prefer to be alone, really. I find it hard to express emotion most of the time. Otherwise, I'm, I'm getting on top of that. Worn out, you know. I mean, just a simple thing to say to sort of Susan, you know, I love you, something like that. I mean, I could, I can tell you about it, but um, I, I really haven't been able to say it freely to Sue, you know. <laughs> well, what was it that you fell in love with? What is it about him? His helplessness, <laughs> I suppose. It was the motherly instinct in me to pick him up and cuddle him, and he's also very good looking, I think, but he doesn't agree <laughs> with me. <laughs> And in, in a summary, he's got this cute little bum in shorts. <laughs> I mean, I can tell quite a few stories here, but, but the one that really irritates me the most is when we have an argument, he says, that's it, leave me. And I say, fine, all right, I will one day. <laughs> but that's it. You know, after all these years of marriage, we've been married for, what, 13 years now or something, and he still says, you're leaving me. Well, one day I might just pack my bags and go, yes. <laughs> at seven, Paul was at a children's home in London. Were you happy at the children's home in England? We didn't mind that really, because we didn't know what was going on, because they were a bit young. My mother and father got, well they separated originally I think. Um, they eventually got divorced. I went to the boarding school for one year and then we immigrated to Australia. <coughs> My father got remarried. Um, and how did you get on with your stepmother? 
pretty well, but like I said before, I mean, I'm not, I'm not just not close. I'm not really close to my father either. Here we go. Here we go, Robert. Here we go. Emily, do you want to prepare? Do you have any regrets about the fact that you weren't closer to him when you were younger? Yeah, I suppose it's all, all wasted time in a way, I suppose. But, I mean, he was always there, you know, I could always talk to him, but it, it was different. A lot of people that go out to Australia and live English people, they grow up without family, you know, and then all of a sudden Paul's come here and he's got all this family that he, he sort of half knew existed. Now, the first one, the red brick one... So Paul brought Sue and his two children, Katie and Robert, to visit the family for the first time. Do you think about England much when you're in Australia? I think when the cricket's on. <laughs> I mean, I'm in awe of everything I see because I've always wanted to come to London. I've always thought it'd be a great thing to do. And um, all of a sudden I'm here and I'm having a great time and the Paul and the kids are just, I'm just dragging them along behind like an anchor, you know. Come on, we're off. But no, it'll be really interesting because I've always had lots of family and I, and I love this sort of stuff, you know. A bit of a show pony. <laughs> When the crunch came and we were coming over here, I didn't want to do it. It's just something in me that holds me back. I, I just, it's shyness or something, I'm not sure. I, I'm not really good at meeting new people, I guess. That toy. Is there any way you would want to be a father any differently from the way your father was to you? I, I'd like to be more um, contact close, actual physical contact close, because my dad and I are. Uh, exactly the same like that we you know if we hug it's unusual <laughs> when we had Katie when she was born Paul was he said to me he said, oh, I'm glad I've got a daughter he said, mm. when I'm an old man at least she'll come up and she'll be able to give me a kiss and a cuddle do you like to get married uh, Paul tell me why not I don't like um say you had a wife they they say you had to eat what they cooked you and, and say I don't like greens, well I don't. Um, and say she said you have to eat what what you get, give. So I I don't like greens. Say she gives me greens, and, that, and that's it. Yeah, divorce was something new to me. I think of what Paul's been through. I mean, Paul doesn't say it's very bad, but I wouldn't like that for my children. What keeps this marriage together? Learn to keep your mouth quiet at times. <laughs> I don't know. Tolerance, I think, really. I mean, we don't stew it. We have arguments, big arguments like anyone else. Um, but we have spoken about this before. We, we don't seem to stew over it for any length of time now. We can be unbelievable together, you know, like biting each other's heads off. But, but we don't... I mean, it would never go another to the next mm. day. This is one thing that the show's done to us, is that it makes you analyse things a bit more, you know, like maybe if the show hadn't been here, we, we may have split up because you think, well, we can see what we were like a long time ago and it, and it, and it brings it back to you, you think, well, you know, we, we have this mm. then. Often a lot of people grow apart and they can't see what they had originally. I don't think the show could actually hold you together. No, no, but, it, but what it's showing you is what you had in the past. Yeah. In their twenties, Paul and Sue sold up, bought an old van, and travelled through Australia. I think it brought us closer together because you know we really got to know each other and we relied on each other so much. It gave us our own peace of mind that we could settle down and, and now have a family, that we had done something. We hadn't just been nobodies and lived in suburbia all our lives. We'd done something that we were proud of that you know we'd accomplished on our own. Being together so much, it, it was hard. But then we settled down and we must have settled down really well because I got pregnant and, <laughs> and everything, so something must have we been going up. right. <laughs> the family settled down in a working class suburb of Melbourne. And the mark taken by Watson, who's Are you ambitious for your children, Paul? I said about wanting Robert to be a brain surgeon. But that was a joke. I mean, like if he's a brain surgeon, it would be well, but it would be nice to let them go one step up from us, I think. At the moment, I'm pretty happy with Katie, and I'm not having a go at Rob, but I've got fears for Robert, because uh, he's struggling a little bit. He's only been at school for two years, been in preps in grade one, and he's had three teachers already that say they don't know how to motivate him. What does university mean? 
when the last show was on, I said to Robert, do you think you'll go to university? He goes, well, what's a university? It just floored me. It just proves that high education wasn't, isn't a major point to us. I mean, just getting him out of first grade was a major importance to us. And so university seems a long way off. And so we just take each year as it comes. I was going to be a policeman, but I thought how hard it would be to join in. I just haven't made up my mind yet. I was going to be a phys ed teacher, but uh, one of the teachers told me that uh, you had to get up into university. At 21, Paul was working as a junior partner for a firm of bricklayers in Melbourne. By 28, he had gone out on his own as a subcontractor, but it didn't work out. Since then, he's had a variety of jobs in the building trade. Well, I'm more of a trade person than a business person. You know. um, I, I've never had any business training, and, and if I've got natural ability, I probably haven't used it. Where did the confidence go? I mean, was, did I lose it because of it, or did I never have it? I think the confidence was never there. I think it's just, it might run in the family somewhere, sort of thing. I think it maybe it's the lack of security that he felt when he was a child, perhaps. That's my theory, my theory alone. I mean, that's the old thing, isn't it? When, when one of your parents are taken away from you, you lack security. And the monitor's up in the washroom, sends the nurse out, well, there's no talking. No, I wasn't talking. Katie now has this saying, oh, you know me, I'm hopeless. And it's just Paul, you know, oh, you know me, I can't do this. And it's sort of like this defeatist attitude type of thing. But, oh, I don't know, I just ignore it and just go along my merry way, I suppose. He has got better. I, I think as you get older, mature, you know, confidence does come to a point. I really went through a stage, oh, it must seem stupid because it's only a bricklayer, like I failed. But something happened with that job and I started to, maybe I did, I started to look at what we had and think, well, what do you want out of life? What's so bad about what we got? Do you, the two of you have a dream now? I've always wanted to move to the country. And I, and I wouldn't mind a small property, it doesn't have to be big or flash more relaxed style of living and an attractive sort of lifestyle. We've just been together for so long we just sort of um, plot along together. Yeah. Look, I mean I enjoy his company and he enjoys mine most of the time. Yeah. I know that he's going to come home to me every night. I'm going to have someone there. He's very s secure that way. She does put up with a lot. I mean, I'm not, I can't be that easy to live with. I'm nice, but I'm not that easy to live. Well, we, we pretend we've got swords, and uh, yeah. we make the noise of the swords fighting, and then uh, when somebody stabs us, we go, ah. I think if you're healthy and have good friends, you can get on perfectly well. But everybody would like to be rich. I, I came to London, and uh, I contacted an agency for squatters and they were able to um, give me the address of uh, somebody who was able to help people who were looking for accommodation in the in the London area. But you've kicked against the stability that's... I don't think I ever had any stability to be quite honest. I can't think of any time in my life when I ever did. I don't think I've been kicking against anything. I think I've been kicking in mid-air the whole of my life. I've been moving about a bit between different places really. I'm a bit unsettled but I'm very shortly moving to, to live in, in digs. At 28, Neil was roaming around Britain. We found him on the west coast of Scotland. If the state didn't give us any money, it would probably just mean crime. And I'm glad I don't have to, to steal to keep myself alive. If the money runs out, well, then for a few days there's nowhere to go to. And that's just, that's all you can do. I simply have to find the, the warmest shed I can find. At 35, he's living in a council flat in the Shetland Islands. The nice thing about here is that you can cut yourself off when you, when you want. Because there are people living around, but they're pretty quiet people. It's an environment which sustains me. It's one in which I can survive. I still feel my real place is in, is in the world of... Or, or, 
the world where, where people are doing what the majority of people do. Um, and the reason I don't feel safe is because I think I'm getting more and more used to this, this, this lifestyle, um, which eventually I shall have to give up. How do you manage for money these days? Social security, still. I wish it wasn't, but uh, I'm afraid it is. Well, I've no desire to be putting the taxes up and dr drawing money off people who, who've earned it, uh, earned it themselves. Uh, but that's the way it is. Well, I'm going to take people to the country and sometimes take them to the seaside and, and uh, I'll have a big loud speaker in the motor coach and tell them whereabouts we are and what, and what we're going to do and, and what the name of the road is and all about that. Neil was brought up in a Liverpool suburb, went to a local comprehensive school and Aberdeen University. He dropped out after a term and at 21 was working on a building site in London. At 28, he was homeless. How do people regard you here? Well, I'm still known as an eccentric, as I have been since... Uh, about the age of 16 or so. Do the days seem long for you? They can do. Do you have any friends anywhere? I have some good friends still in England. Neil settled down in the Shetland Islands a couple of years ago. <laughs> Hello Neil, how are you? Hello. Is this community important to you? Yes, it has to be. This is where I live. Um, it, it's been very good to me. Um, people um, have been especially kind in, in many areas. And I, I'd like to be putting something back into it. And we'd be putting something back into the whole of Shetland, not just, not just into, our, into this area. Um, I'll take two pints of milk, please. There we are, Neil. And how's the pantomime, then? Not so bad. Oh, that's good. No traumas. It's not on my part, but um, a few people could do with learning their lines a bit better. But you're all right. Well, I shouldn't speak too soon. When I grow up, I want to be an astronaut. But if I can't be an astronaut, I think I'll be a coach driver. This is probably linked up with the fact now that I want to travel. I mean, my thoughts haven't really changed differently. I definitely wouldn't like to be a coach driver now. I suppose I w Yes, well... I would like to be somebody in a position of importance, and I've always thought this. Um, but I don't think I'd, I'm, I'm the right sort of person to carry the responsibility for whatever it is. I always thought, well, I'd love to be, <laughs> possibly even love to be in politics or something like this. But um, I suppose that, I'd probably find that just as tedious as, uh, as, as, as all the other jobs I've done. So. Oh, all the things I always thought I could do. Uh, I could give lectures on, on erudite subjects that I'd read all about, or I could, I could work in the theatre, uh, perhaps lighting or uh, directing a, a show. And is all that lost to you? It does seem to be, yes. The Village Pantomime, 1990. Beauty and the Beast. Matthew! Oh. Matthew! Your, your, your house, sir, is, uh, is needing maybe some repairs. <laughs> I think the attendance at last year's pantomime on the Saturday night was the biggest crowd of West of Shetland folk I've ever seen in one place. And, you know, we're pleased with that and we think they enjoyed it. We've had good receptions in other parts of Shetland as well. We, we did tour one play. I think we're moving into a, an age when um, there's going to be more stress on the community. When bigger policies are fairly set, are fairly predictable, and the, the, the emphasis is going to fall on local organisation. You directed it last year and you're not this year. Why is that? 
Well, the, the specific reason is that we had a preliminary meeting and I was, my name was not put forward as the, uh, as the one um, as all they wanted. So. Why would that be? Probably because I like to do things in my own way. Um, I'm perhaps quite an authoritative director. I have my own idea of the, the performance before we even start. And I don't like people to deviate from that. And during the course of a production, of course, people come along with suggestions. No, I, I accept suggestions. I don't just go along without listening to people. But I know how I want the thing. And once I deviate once from that idea, the whole thing actually falls apart. It's not a work of art anymore. I'm not claiming that I've produced marvellous works of art. But I do know what I'm aiming for. Alas, poor master, still sleeping. Shall I awaken him? I think everybody wants to be somebody. And when you can't actually be anything in your ordinary life, if you feel there's a sphere in which you can excel, then it's great. I mean, I know how much pleasure people who take photographs get when their work is praised. And that's, you know, perhaps it's much the, the same thing. We're just having a quick look at your plan, yes. uh, as it stands. What I have done, I've, I've taken lists of all the, the community halls in Shetland with their capacity. Neil is trying to organise a professional to touring theatre company. If a hall only seats 60 people, it may not be worth um, putting on a show there. So I mean, what was your response then to the fact that only four folk turned up at the... <laughs> I, mean, the I, was similar, I was disappointed, but um, I, I think it proves the point that I've been trying to make, that you can't just expect people to turn up for a group from outside Shetland when they don't know what the thing's about. I've had an instinctive feeling that I was a writer since I was 16. I never really wanted to be anything else. I would actually pay to have something published. Because I think that's important. I think I, would, I could find somebody who would recognise something. There must be something in what I've done. I don't think it's all useless. I, I probably am overvaluing it. But I know how much effort went into some of it. And on, on that strength alone, I, I, I just can't believe it's useless. With each successive play, I don't know who I'm trying to speak to and um, what I'm trying to say to them, whether they're listening. Um, I just keep going because that's what I feel I should be doing. In the winter, if you lived in the country, well, it was just all wet and there wouldn't be anything for miles around. And you get so and if you get soaked if you tried to go out and there's no shelter anywhere except in your own house. But in the town you can go out on, on wet wintry days because you can always find somewhere to shelter because there's lots of places. I don't think I've been, I've been typical of the environment in which I lived. What my background has given me is a sense of just being part of a very impersonal society. You finish the week, you come home, you plug into the TV set for the weekend and then you manage to get back to work on Monday. And it seems to me that this is just a, a slow path to a total brainwashing. And, and if you have a brainwashed society, then you're heading towards doom. There's no question about that. Well, it wasn't too bad last night, anyway. It was better than it's been for a while, I think. There was an enormous reaction to you in the previous film. What did people see in you, do you think? It seemed that I was representing some kind of successful escapism or somebody who'd managed to be totally himself, hadn't given in to, to pressure of society to conform. And people flooded me with, with letters. And people seemed to think I could solve their personal problems. And I was quite frightened because I knew I couldn't. But what, what really bothered me was people seemed to see something in me that I hadn't been aware of myself. All I was aware of was that I didn't have anywhere to go, I had nothing to do, I had no money. Um, I felt let down by quite a lot of people. Um, I didn't think my life was a success, but suddenly everybody seemed to think so. But the most nagging thing was that whatever, even if a million people had written to me, it wouldn't have made any difference in my own situation. When I get married, I don't want to have any children, be because they are always doing naughty things and making the whole house untidy. I, I always told myself that um, I would never have children. Why? Because, because, well, because children inherit something from their parents. And even if my wife were the most um, high-spirited and ordinary and normal of people, um, the child would still stand a very fair chance of being not totally uh, full of happiness because of what he or she will have inherited from me. Have you given up on women? Um, well, what, how shall we say? Oh, 
all but, you know. I mean, there's always, everybody always, every unmarried man and I suppose every unmarried woman hopes for, for somebody who will, um, will actually come along to, to change their life. But um, the practical reality is the chances of my finding somebody who, could, who would put up with me in my, in my integrity is, uh, you know, are few. Uh, so. What would you look for in a woman? Well, I, I might look for various things, but what's probably more important is what somebody would look for in me. I, I can't offer reliability. I mean, I think most women looking for a husband or a, um, a steady man want somebody who is, is reliable in some way or other. Well, I, I cannot offer that because I don't know what I'm going to be like from one day to the other. And it would be foolish me pretending that, you know, that I could offer something like that. I can offer sincerity. I can offer um, compassion, um, willingness to, to, sort of, to do my part, to, to put my wife's interest as high as my own. Um, no doubt these are, I'm sure these are important, but I, I cannot say, look, you know, in 10 years time, I'll still be bringing a wage in, even, especially if I don't start in that situation, uh, you know. Do you worry about your sanity? Um, other people sometimes worry about it. Like who? Uh, as I said, I, I sometimes can be found behaving in, 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 in an erratic fashion. Um, I sometimes get very frustrated, very angry, for, for no apparent reason, for a reason which, which won't be apparent to other people around me. Um, it's happened from time to time. Are you getting better or worse, do you think, your states? I don't think there's any significant change in the sort of... I, I said I haven't been so depressed since I've been in Shetland. Um, I said my basic personality is not a lot different. Are you having any medical treatment for your mood changes? And your no, I haven't for many years. Because I wouldn't like to be dependent upon man-made substances for, for, for the cure. Do you ever think you're going mad? Oh, I don't think it. I, I know it. Uh, I, uh, well, because we... We're not allowed to use the word mad. But, um, you know, uh, it, it, I, think, I think most people are mad here. Really, um, but serious? then I think it's a mad world. Uh, I think uh, I mean I remember, I remember working in London twelve years ago, and just walking through the city, and they were digging up the drains, and there were cranes knocking down buildings, and there were cars trying to get down impossible narrow alleys and having to reverse out again, and policemen doing all kinds of things. And I thought this this world is just mad. You know, this is this world is just mad. Yes, I'd say I believed in God. Are you religious? Well, I go to church with my parents on Sundays. Uh, I don't know even now whether I do believe in God or not. I've thought an, an awful lot about it, actually, and uh, I still don't know. But still, this was absolutely certain. One, if one was to survive in the world, one had to believe in God. And how has he been treating you? <laughs> well, I said to somebody uh, last week that I preferred the Old Testament to the New Testament because in the Old Testament, God is very unpredictable. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, how I, I've seen him in, in my life. Sometimes uh, very benevolent, sometimes seemingly needlessly unkind. Well, after, after I tried every remedy one could possibly think of for my, my personality disorders, um, I thought, well, I'm going to trust God because other people have done so, seemingly with, um, with positive results. I can't say the moment I trusted God my life was fine. And I can't say all the time that I think I've I found the answer. But um, I can say with some certainty that once I started believing that there is, there is actually a God who has something of a, a design for the world, who is working in a certain way in the world. After that, some things became clear to me. I really can't say much, much more than that. Come people, we don't like them very much. No, it's, it sounds like ghostly coloured people. Hmm. Do you think of a, of a purple person with yeah. red eyes and yeah. yellow feet? And it, 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 yeah. it can't really think about what, it really, what they really look like. I, I find it hard to believe that I was ever like that, but there's, there's the evidence. And probably when I was seven, I just lived in a wonderful world where everything was, was sensation and done. I could be happy like this, I could be miserable next day.
I don't have a yearning for any past time in my life. Perhaps in my subconscious, I recall a time when everything was a lot happier. My teens were, were terribly unhappy years. If we come back in seven years, how would you like us to find you? In a job from which I was getting satisfaction. Married. Probably with children. With a, a good salary. Enough to, to, as I said before, to, to be able to live fairly comfortably. Um, and with friends whom I could contact when I wanted to. So do you think you have failed? I can't really judge. Do you feel you failed yourself? Well, my life isn't over. Can you think what you'd like to be doing in the year 2000? I can think of all kinds of things I'd like to be doing. The real question is what, what, am, I, what am I likely to be doing? Um, what are you likely to be doing? <laughs> and that's a horrible question. Um, I tend to think the most likely answer is that I'll be wandering homeless around the streets of London. But um, with a bit of luck that would happen. I always feel that somehow um, a good fairy has waved a wand over me and saved me from that. Because that seemed very much what the end would be for a while. That's perhaps why I cling on here. I know how tempting it is to escape into fantasies. To believe that I already am a successful writer. To believe that I've got lots of friends. Um, to believe that if only I had done such and such, my life would have been different. But I mean, the, the most difficult thing is, is to accept the reality. To be what we are in a situation. Really, that's terribly difficult. I don't lost their trousers. The same time that time. No, not the same time. I lost you, my moustache fell off. Beard. At the end of their very special day in London, after their trip to the zoo and the party, we took our children to an adventure playground where they could do just what they liked. Those from the children's home set about building a house. There's Nicholas. And Tim. Andrew. And Bruce. John. Susie. Jackie and her friends. Give me a child until he is seven, and I will give you the man. This has been a glimpse of Britain's future.